Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your part number 3 of the third test that we conducted on 26th of the February. In this particular video, we are going to discuss uh, the next 20 set of the questions that is 41 to question number 60 and we are going to discuss them. We will try to make them uh, you know, more simpler for you in this particular discussion but before we begin the discussion, this is an important announcement for every UPSC aspirant out there. Guys, if you are really looking for some uh, high quality test series, so probably this is your chance to get the PMF test series at a very, very reasonable price. Now, it's a very limited time offer that we are offering you 1000 high quality MCQs for just rupees 499. So if you are interested to really, uh, you know, attempt those kind of questions, which are going to increase your chances of clearing the prelims, do check out the link that is given in the description. It's a very special price going to expire soon. So don't miss the chance and be a part of our test series initiative. So now in this particular uh, question number 41, which was asked, the, so the very first thing you have to be careful if they're asking you which is correct or not correct. Now this is uh, probably one of the most common mistake we people make. So be very, very careful uh, if it's asking, asking you the correct one or the non-correct one. Now the question was with respect to Raja Ram Mohan Roy, very prominent figure in modern India. Uh, he is known as the father of modern India in fact. Now um, what you are supposed to know about Raja Ram Mohan Roy and then we will come back to the question. So of course he, ha he uh, has done a lot of things in his lifetime. Raja Ram Mohan Roy is considered to be the first great leader of modern India. Like I told you it is also called the father of modern India. And Raja Ram Mohan Roy, he believed in the philosophy of Vedanta and um, because he, he thought that the philosophy of Vedanta was more logical, it was more uh, based on the principle of reason. He was a logical person, he was a more rationalist kind of person. And in getting inspired and believing in the philosophy of Vedanta, he then criticized the practices of Hinduism, uh, you know, that, that were prevailing that time, including the idolatry, the polytheism and even the rigidity of the caste. But the most important work that he started or he had done was when he started the campaign against the practice of the Sati. I mean, uh, the practice of the Sati got banned in India later, uh, later in 1839 or something because of the efforts of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And at that particular time, he started a campaign beginning in 1880. Uh, he argued for a lot, lot of changes that Hinduism or Hindu religion that time was needing. And he uh, argued for changes like monotheism. He said there has to be abolition of the Sati. Widow remarriage, he really, uh, you know, made that point of the re remarriage of the widows, made it more mainstream, I would say. He also talked about the right of inheritance and the property to, to the women. These are some of the very progressive and important uh, points put forward by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Be very careful, he also established many colleges. The prominent uh, school and the colleges that he established was in Calcutta. He started 1817, he started an English school. He also established a Vedanta college in 1825. But be very careful, many people get this wrong when it comes to Hindu college. He himself never established the Hindu college. He helped David Hare in establishing the Hindu college way back in 1817. Lot of people have this confusion. He was not directly involved or he was not uh, 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 related to Hindu college establishment. He helped David Hare, not directly involved. Then one more thing, uh, like Raja Ram Mohan Roy to you know, propagate lot of uh, reforms in the Hindu dharm that time. He started and he formed many organizations. He started in 1814, he started Amitya Sabha, then, uh, sorry, Atmiya Sabha. Then 1828, he also founded the Brahma Sabha that later came to be known as Brahma Samaj also, very famous. This is probably one of the most famous organization that he, that he established, he founded. The major purpose of Brahma Samaj was to purify the Hinduism and he preached monotheism. And he was also a pioneer of Indian journalism. Because of him, we got some of the best journals of that particular time. I mean, he, he started uh, a journal called as Sambad Komudi in Bengali language. In Persian, he started the Mirat, Mirat Ul Akbar, 
well guys when it comes to raja ram mohan roy these all these publications all these organizations become really important you may have you may have mcqs on journals and the newspaper also so whenever you preparing for the modern india do prepare all these important journals and newspaper started by the revolutionaries of that time okay this is important now if you look at the question you would find everything is fine but then the the third statement you will find ha has a problem the third statement says he established hindu college like i told you he never established he helped david hare to establish the hindu college and that make this statement not correct other other three are absolutely correct he believed in the philosophy of vedanta criticized all this started a campaign against sati argued for the right of inheritance he founded brahma sama so everything is fine the only problem was this now i would say this is a very easy question because raja ram mohan roy is is a kind of personality without reading him uh, modern india cannot be studied so definitely very easy something that you can attempt very well uh because other facts are quite prominent i mean we you we know about his relation with the abolition of sati we know about brahma samaj already we know his philosophy of vedanta so other three are very well uh you can think of and then you you could have simply eliminated this c being the wrong one because others are quite famous facts now in the question number 42 uh, the question was with respect to the monsoon now two important concepts here now the question talks about monsoon trough which is a low pressure belt and the monsoon break so these two topics are important and uh, understanding these two will come back and we'll see how this question could have been solved now you know you because monsoon is one of the most important and basic uh, uh, you know uh, topics that you are supposed to prepare in your geography especially the indian geography part now when you whenever you studying uh, whenever you study the monsoon you know that uh, monsoon the beginning of the monsoon starts with the with the movement of the itcz you know um, normally what we have near the equator we have this inter tropical convergence zone from where from uh, like you know where uh, these trade winds coming northeast trades and the southeast trades the two trade winds they converge at a one particular location and that location is somewhere near equator maybe plus minus 10 10 degree to 10 degree it very a little bit but this location is called the itcz this is a normal position of the itcz near the equator but you know during the summer times the all the pressure belts during the summer time due to the apparent movement of the sun all pressure belts shift northwards and in that particular time the normal itcz which was somewhere around the equator normally actually shifts to the to the ganga plains of india when when this itcz when it shifts northwards it came to be known as monsoon trough it is the it is it is a new position of the itcz over the ganga plains but rather than calling it as uh, itcz we call it as monsoon trough the same itcz becomes the monsoon trough monsoon trough the word trough in geography actually signifies to the low pressure wherever you see the word trough it means i'm talking about the low pressure and this is very important without the shifting of the itcz over the ganga plains of india we would never ever be possible to have the monsoon rain in india now we got the low pressure on the mainland india and this is probably one of the first condition we need to attract the uh, you know to attract the winds to attract the south southeastern trades normally that southeastern trades were supposed to meet itcz at equator now since the itcz has shifted as monsoon trough these southeast uh, trades they have to cross the equator to search for the itcz and in that uh, due to coriolis force these south east trades become the southwest and that's why they are called the southwest monsoon uh, the winds so basically the trade winds only they are bringing about the monsoon in india Uh, south eastern trades becoming the southwest due to due to the coriolis and we are getting a rainfall over india now now this elongated pressure area uh, of northward shifting of the itcz is called the monsoon trough i told you now there is another very important term called as a monsoon break now look at the word the the word itself says a lot the word itself monsoon break means that particular time when i am going to have 
break or there is absence of the rainfall during the monsoon time that that word is called monsoon break now you see monsoon break occurs whenever the monsoon trough shift northwards to the himalayan foothills like normally i told you the monsoon trough is supposed to be over the ganga plains but sometimes due to excessive shift what if this monsoon trough actually surpasses the uh, himalayas itself now if you if you look at this you will understand this is the normal position of the itcz if you see this is the normal position of the itcz but sometimes it actually surpasses the himalayas and if it goes north of the himalayas then definitely the low pressure which was supposed to be on mainland india that that actually goes away and this and whenever this happens we call that particular time as a monsoon break now please why we are discussing it because it was in news that monsoon trough has shifted to the north of himalayas and this in this uh, last year 2023 we had the third longest break due to the shifting of the monsoon trough towards the north of himalayas so and whenever this particular thing happen it is not good for the monsoon pattern over uh, over all of india because whenever that thing happens the himalayan states are going to have excess rainfall because the low pressure has shifted the uh, the himalayan side and the traditional areas of the monsoon like you have, you have the gujarat the rajasthan madhya pradesh you know uh, bihar odisha uh, west bengal these traditional areas of the monsoon they are going to have a dry spell so definitely monsoon break is not good not good for the agriculture also because ultimately the whole pattern of the monsoon is going to get disrupted and that's exactly was there in the third statement that whenever this happens whenever the monsoon uh, break happens it is always going to enhance rainfall in the himalayan state because now over the himalayan states we are going to have the low pressure rest of the india is going to rainfall is going to be suppressed we are going to have a dry spell over the traditional areas the core areas of the monsoon from gujarat to west bengal to the odisha so that is what what happens during the monsoon break now if you look at the question guys you will understand the question was very simple and straight forward uh, the first statement said that the monsoon trough elongated low pressure area always remember trough low pressure i told you again now this is over the indian subcontinent northward shifting of the itcz why it happens always because every summer season every uh, summers the there is a northward shift of all pressure belt not just the itcz all pressure belts are going to go upward that is because you have more uh, uh, sun rays towards the northern pole northern hemisphere that that is called the apparent movement of the sun so first statement is correct look at the second statement second statement is wrong it says monsoon break occurs when the monsoon trough shift southwards to the indo gangetic plain no when it goes northwards it has to go northward northward of in indo gangetic then only it is going to reach the himalayas if it is coming down but that is not going to happen during the monsoon the monsoon trough will come down during the north east uh, uh, monsoon or the winter monsoon during the winter's time only it is going to come back not during the monsoon time so second is wrong and third is says third is correct rainfall in himalayan states increases rest is it suppresses so answer has to be b two only uh, it was a medium one but something you could have attempted because these are very normal and common concepts of the itcz but be careful about the monsoon break and be careful about the moment uh, where it is going to go question number 43 was with respect to rabindranath tagore in fact uh, last year 2023 mains we also had a mains question on uh, rabindranath tagore it was in gs paper 1 where it was the comparison of gandhi and tagore very important uh, figure in modern india some somebody that you always have should prepare now the question is which statement is going to be the correct statement now you know about rabindranath tagore uh, you know about his contribution now rabindranath tagore is very famously he is known as and is referred as gurudev because he contributed in indian uh, literature music art social reforms and his contributions are clearly unparalleled now in 1915 he was awarded the knighthood by the british king george 5 for his contribution towards 
the literature and other uh, fields and it was british king george v who ga who gave him uh, that knighthood award but in 1919 you know very this was a very famous incident when jallianwala bag massacre happened he was so he was he was so much pained he was so much uh, in sorrow after the jallianwala bag that he renounced his knighthood gave back to the king in 1919 why i am stressing on the year you will understand the question uh, the statement was bit wrong in the question now please remember not just the knighthood he also received nobel prize in literature in 19 1913 for the collection of his poem and his famous book is called gitanjali gitanjali his work gitanjali gave him the nobel prize in literature that made him the first non european to receive this particular honor he is remembered for his song eka chalo re which is one of the most famous songs even today talking about his song composition you should always remember rabindranath tagore as a person who composed the national anthem of two countries national anthem of india jan gan man and he also composed the national anthem of bangladesh amar sonar bangla because that particular time when he created amar sonar bangla Uh, uh the bangladesh was a part of india that particular time later bangladesh government adapted his song as their national song so technically he wrote the national anthems of two particular countries india and bangladesh rabindranath tagore founded viswa bharati university in shanti niketan yesterday also we had a discussion about the shanti niketan a town that he set up in bengal and in his viswa bharati university he emphasized on the holistic approach to the education when i say holistic approach a comprehensive approach that means he was always in a favor that you know what what kind of education we should provide to the students that has to be the best of indian and western tradition i want you to focus on that he he he, he was never uh, against the western education he always educate he always uh, advocated that the best of indian and the best of the western traditions are need to be taught to the upcoming generations he he wanted to take the best from the two and his educational philosophy aimed to foster creativity freedom and the unity of the knowledge he was not against the western one he wanted to have a blend of the two and that actually made him quite unique uh, than mahatma gandhi who was more favoring the uh, the regional languages he was uh, emphasizing more on the vernacular languages that is one of the difference of ravindranath tagore and mahatma gandhi now if you look at the statement it says which statement is the correct one the first statement is wrong because it says he was awarded knighthood in 1919 no he got it in 1915 he renounced it 1919 1913 he became the first non european to receive the nobel prize but not for his work sonar tari but for gitanjali we have just discussed so this work is wrong here and then the third statement is also wrong it says tagore founded vishwa bharati university that is true but it says it was education based on indian traditionals only no the best of indian and the best of the western education also you can't think ravindranath tagore as a conservative he was very liberal in his approach so definitely is going to get the best of the two not uh, opposing anything the third last statement is correct he composed the national anthem of both india and bangladesh i think it was a very easy question uh, something that you could have attempted very easily because all the events which are given in the statement are quite famous they are actually very famous the next question that we have is with respect to the cyclone medicanes now the word medicane has something to do with the medi mediterranean sea so cyclone medicane is basically the cyclone that comes into the mediterranean sea that in that particular area it is also called as mediterranean hurricane hurricane is basically we use the, all these words are same cyclone hurricane typhoon the only difference is the location in atlantic ocean we call cyclones as hurricanes mediterranean you know is the extension of atlantic only so medicane is basically Medi mediterranean hurricane and if you you know the location of the mediterranean sea it lies in the temperate zone since it lies that in the temperate zone that is outside tropics it is also called as extra tropical cyclone now mediterranean cyclones 
are normally formed during the autumn and the winter month. Now this is important and interesting. You know what is the significance of the medicines for for country like India? Like in during the winter months, whenever these medicines or Mediterranean cyclones are formed, it is their moisture that is hooked by the jet streams, and those jet streams carry the moisture of the Mediterranean Sea and brings it uh, to the to India. That actually gave the winter precipitation in India. I mean, if this is India, you see one fourth of India, this north and northwest part of India, it receives the winter rainfall. It receives the. Uh, it is responsible for two very important uh, components. Whenever there is winter precipitation in India, it is number one important for the rabi crops. Rabi crops uh, grow well due to that particular rainfall, and number two for the rejuvenation of the glaciers. For both reasons. these are important so these medicines has actually interesting uh, relation to india and uh, and uh, the precipitation that we receives in our winter month now but but of course they are quite rare talking about the frequency they comes once or twice per year and overall as far as intensities are concerned uh, since they are exotropical cyclones but being that also they are very weak storms they don't last very long medit medicane uh, uh, the they occur more in the colder water now this is a very unique thing that you have to remember normally whenever you think of the cyclones you know the cyclones has a tendency that uh, and it is one of the pre requirement that the the water has to be warmer water i mean there has to be a temperature of 27 degree or plus but the mediterranean hurricanes medicanes are they occur more in the colder waters because you can think of mediterranean sea and you can think the temperature that is there in the temperate zone the core of these storms are always going to be colder as compared to the warm core of the tropical cyclones but that that is that makes them different from the normal tropical cyclone and they also have a symmetric structure very much similar that uh, that that of the tropical Uh, uh, storm like in tropical cyclone we have a structure inside we have the eye of the cyclone and then we have the eye wall and eye wall is surrounded by the rain range uh, zone so that is the kind of same structure that we have for the medicanes also but please remember overall if you look at the size of the medicanes they are typically smaller in diameter comparative because they are weak and being weak they are also smaller in size and they have a lower wind speeds than the tropical cyclones so they are they are very unique very very unique kind of hurricanes that we get in the mediterranean sea if you look at the question it says medicanes usually come in the autumn and the winter yes now here you can you can apply you can apply this logic of mediterranean uh, uh, you know cyclone and india's winter precipitation that could have helped you understand okay they must be coming in the winter because india has a relation with with these kind of cyclones the second statement says the core of these are colder yes the cold because they are they lie in the temperate zones um they are typically smaller in diameter have lower wind speed so all three are correct it uh, the question was a medium one but uh, i think there was no problem you could have risked it uh, easily because the first statement is absolutely correct and the second is also correct the third uh this this the second statement may have troubled you little bit because normally whenever you think of the cyclones you think of the warmer water but uh, considering the temp the temperate zone answer could have been uh, correctly predicted so answer has to be c uh normal question All right okay the uh, the next question 45 the question was with respect to now this particular question was with respect to uh you are supposed to figure out which personality are we referring here so the question was the founder of the self respect movement just by knowing this much now the question becomes easy for us you have one prominent figure in the politics of tamil nadu now one particular figure who actually gave a cultural identity to the tamil nation and that name is ev Rama Swami Nayakar he was the founder of self respect movement strongly anti caste anti religion in his outlook he advocated the major social reforms related to the caste and gender he opposed the domination of hindi and then he started the tamil politics 
of their own Tamil language. And even today, whatever he has seeded in the politics of Tamil, it is, it is still very much the same politics that we have in Tamil Nadu, right? And Mr. E. V. Ramaswamy Nayakar is more popularly known as the Periyar. His, his favorite name, his more popular name is Periyar. He was, the, he was the one who started and founded the self-respect movement way back 1925. Because why started the self-respect movement? As the name says, self-respect. So definitely it was strongly anti-caste and anti-religion in the outlook. Because that particular time, 1925, the casteism was very heavy uh, in, in the Hindu dharma. There were a lot of uh, caste discrimination happening that time. And to strongly oppose that uh, caste sentiments, he started the self-respect movement. He opposed the domination of Hindi. He emphasized that the Tamil nation, Tamil Nadu has a distinct cultural identity and it should be respected, that, that's all. And that is why the name self-respect is more relevant. <coughs> In 1938, he started uh, the, the Justice Party uh, of which he was a member. The self-respect movement and justice party, they came together. 1944, there was a, the, there was a birth of new outfit called as the Dravida uh, the uh, Kazagam. Now, he was anti-Brahmin, anti-Congress and anti-Aryan. Please remember. And he launched uh, uh, the movement for independent Dravida nation, which of course could not be completed. Now, why I'm, why I'm telling you the details? Because what he started as a party, as DM, now... Later on, after independence, Mr. Periyar, he refused to contest the elections. So in 1949, one of his uh, member, one of his very close colleague, CN Annadurai, he split from uh, him, from his party due to the ideological differences. And there he formed the very, very famous party, DMK party of Tamil Nadu. Later on, it was due to the difference of uh, Mr. Annadurai, after the death of Annadurai, uh, M. Karuna Nidhi took the control of DMK, which is still one of the prominent party of Tamil politics. But 1972, the actor turned politician MGR, the MG Ramachandran, he led the split in the party and he formed his own AIA DMK party, uh, of which um, Jay Lalita was the was the member and later became the chief minister. So, it, it is whatever has happened under the uh, Mr. Periyar. E. V. Ramana, Ramaswamy Nayakar still affects the politics of Tamil Nadu and that is why the question is so important and relevant but I think only remembering the self-respect movement I think and I think in 2015 we also have a we had a question very similar to this if you look at the previous year questions I think we had one of the questions on the self-respect movement so answer was pretty simple pretty uh, direct answer of E. V. Ramaswamy Nayakar. Now going ahead, going forward with the next question, which is about the Sanatan Dharm. Now very important Sanatan Dharm question, uh, which statement is correct is suppose you are supposed to figure out. What you know about Sanatan Dharm is important because this question needs a bit of knowledge, bit of depth knowledge. In fact, I, I would say Sanatan Dharm is as the name says, it's a Sanskrit word, Sanskrit term. The word Sanatan Dharm actually translates as the eternal religion, something that was there even before we were there on the earth. Eternal is something which, which, is, which is unshakable, which was in the past and it is continuously going forward, is called eternal, something that has never been destroyed, something that was already there and always there and always will be there, that is called Sanatan Dharm. Now, the word Sanatan Dharm, however, is not mentioned anywhere in the Vedas. So, from where this word actually came, the word Sanatan Dharm was first used in Bhagavad Gita. So, many people have this confusion. Sanatan Dharm is not mentioned in the Vedas. It was the Bhagavad Gita that for the first time used the word Sanatan Dharm. In the context of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sri Krishna telling a lot of things to Arjuna. Now, the word, the term is used, this word, the term Sanatan Dharm actually is used by Hindus, Jains and Buddhists. And why do they use it? Because see, Sanatan Dharm word is used by these three religions because all the three religions believe in the concept of the rebirth. So all the three that believes in the concept of rebirth uses the term Sanatan Dharm as an eternal religion. 
बट दिस वर्ड सनातन धर्म इज नेवर यूज बाय अदर रिलीजन्स लाइक क्रिश्चैनिटी इस्लाम एंड जुडाइजम बिकॉज दे बिलीव इन ओनली वन लाइफ ओके ना इफ यू लुक एट द क्वेश्चन इफ यू लुक एट द क्वेश्चन विच वॉज बींग आस्ट यू वुड से द वेरी फर्स्ट स्टेटमेंट लुक्स करेक्ट दैट इज नो नो प्रॉब्लम एट ऑल but look at the second statement it says the word sanatan mentioned in the vedas no it is not mentioned in vedas the term sanatan used by hindus yes jains are christians using it no i told you the word sanatan and the, the term sanatan is used by only those religions believing in the concept of the rebirth so christians do not believe that so second and third are wrong answer has to be a i would say this question was a medium one but something that you could have risked because the word itself says a lot about it sanatan is something which is eternal uh yeah second was a little bit difficult i understand but uh, you could have you could have risk it and you read more about sanatan because uh, these days it's very much popular uh, you may expect a question on sanatan dharma as well next question is with respect to the aadhar act 2016 now whenever you talking about the act whenever you talking about the statutory body uidai the very first statement says the very first statement is correct half correct half not correct because look at the ministry the the first statement says act aadhar act constituted uidai we know that this is the statutory authority that takes care of all the biometric data of the aadhar it is uidai that that stores and controls the data that we have given as our biometric data to the aadhar now it says it that this this authority is it under ministry of social justice and empowerment no so 90% i told you 90% time the ministries are going to trick you so be very very careful with the ministries 90% upsc is going to trick you with the ministries so under which ministry it comes you know about the aadhar very well we all uses aadhar a lot it's a 12 digit identification number it's a proof of identity now please very importantly lot of confusion happens with the aadhar now normally uh, it it used to believe that aadhar was a proof of citizenship it used to be considered as a proof of citizenship but re very recently supreme court has clarified aadhar is not a proof of citizenship it is just a proof of identity that's it because even the non citizens of india they are still holding the aadhar cards so very clearly supreme court has said it is no not a proof of citizenship it's just your id proof it's a 12 digit identity identification number assigned to us by the uidai and that particular uh, authority which is a statutory authority actually works under ministry of electronic and it which is called the maiti so please remember the ministries are important it is not ministry of social justice it is this ministry that works Uh, under which it works the second statement is correct yes because um, very recently there was controversy over the uh, constitutional validity of the aadhar but supreme court in 2018 supreme court clarified it upheld the constitutional validity of aadhar it says yes aadhar is valid no problem in that but very clearly it said that uh, even the aadhar act was passed as a money bill supreme court upheld that also but again it says it is not it should not be mandatory aadhar use should be voluntary and you can't make every person compelled to use aadhar as a proof of identity it is one of the many proof that you have and very recently i think last year only supreme court has said that it is no more a proof of citizenship it's just a proof of identity okay that is important so uh, but overall it was found valid and constitutional by the supreme court of india now the first statement is wrong i told you the ministry has a problem in the statement the second says is correct yes uh, the parental or guardian consent is needed if you if you are a child if if you are uh, less than 18 years of age and you are registering for aadhar of course your parents or the guard uh, guardians consent is needed which is very obvious uh, that is there for everything that in india uh, before 18 you need to have a consent from the parents of the guardian right so yeah the statement 2 uh, is right i think it was a very easy question should have attempted uh, best all you have to be is more careful with, with the ministries okay now the next question is a very straight forward question it was again related to aadhar and you know for the safety measures of aadhar 
the UIDI has started many many initiatives. Now one of that initiative is the virtual Aadhaar ID. Now what is this virtual Aadhaar ID was the question. Is it virtual Aadhaar ID? Is it the OTP based authentication? No, it is not OTP based authentication. Is it a temporary 16 digit random number? Yes. Virtual Aadhaar, normal Aadhaar is your 12 digit. Now this is important. Be careful. Normal physical Aadhaar is 12 digit unique code that you have, right? Whenever you download your virtual Aadhaar ID and virtual Aadhaar ID is nowadays it is being asked for many purpose. So if you download your virtual Aadhaar ID, it is a 16 digit random number that replaces your Aadhaar number for extra privacy, for extra security during the authentication. So that your real 12 digit number does not need to be shown or doesn't need to be disclosed. So that nobody nobody can peep into the privacy and security of your Aadhaar on authentication. To have that security, virtual Aadhaar ID is a 16 digit code that is being generated. In fact, there are other security measures also. Like for example, this last concept, you know, out of the out of the total 12 digit, the first eight digits are embedded like this. They are they are hidden like this. And this is called your masked Aadhaar. But it is masked Aadhaar, it, is, it has nothing to do with the virtual Aadhaar ID. So answer in this case has to be the B. That is important guys. So this question was a medium one but, but something uh, you, you could have attempted because uh, or, or in case if you are not very comfortable you can still risk it because you can eliminate at least the first and the third. Now the only confusion could have been between B and D that much you, you could have risked. Uh, it can be the mass Aadhaar or the virtual Aadhaar. But if you have used, because Aadhaar is very common thing and probably we all have used it at some point of our time uh, in, in our uh, normal activity. That's why this question becomes really important for you. Okay, Security measure, measures are important for Aadhaar security. The next question that we have is with respect to question number 49 and this question is about the places of the worship act 1991. Why this particular question is important? Now you know uh, very recently uh, you know uh, we we have inaugurated uh, the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, and um, it was it was a dispute of Babri Masjid and the Ram Janam Bhumi, and after the settlement of this particular uh, uh, you know this particular case, now there is a demand of Gyan Vapi Mosque where people are demanding that they should get the access and they are going to they want to make a temple over there as well. And there are a few more mosques um, and you know these religious places which are in conflict uh, you know the kind of thing that is happening these days. Now the point is in such scenario the, the very the most important act that governs these kind of issues becomes very prominent for your exam. Now in this places of the worship act what you are supposed to be aware of this particular worship places of worship act 1991 it was made it actually seeks to prevent the new claims and disputes over the historical status of the places of the worship and the land they occupy. It was in 1991 you know 1991 the Babri Masjid was demolished after that Babri Masjid case only this act was passed so that so that there is no uh, like whatever there is status quo whatever the place of worship is there you are not going to have any new claim there should not be any new dispute on the historical status of that places of the worship after the after what we saw in the babri masjid this act was passed and <coughs> this particular statement uh, this particular act actually says that the religious character of the places of the worship they shall be maintained as it existed on 15th August 1947, the day India got independence. After India's independence, if it was a mosque, should be a mosque. If it is a temple, should be a temple. I mean, no religious character of that place of the worship is going to be changed. It has to be same. So this is the baseline that the this is the base from which the act was considered. But but in case, in case there is a, a pending cases of the claim, uh, they like all the pending cases to be terminated, no new case will be filed so as to maintain the religious harmony in the society. But 
if there is any change of status if anybody will try to change any status in that particular case legal proceedings can be initiated for the offenders for those people who are going to disrupt the religious harmony against them the legal proceedings will be there and it would also not apply to any suit that was settled before 1991 act came into the force it is only after 1991 that this act is going to uh, uh, to uh, connect okay now if you look at the question the first and the second statements you will find them as correct no problem at all uh, both the things are quite okay problem is with the second uh, the third statement if you look now according to this act the pending cases will be terminated this this is fine but it says no new cases will be filed and it says no legal proceedings can be issued of course we can that is for that purpose only we got the place of the worship act na so those who are going to disrupt those who are going to have any new claims those people will be punished there will be legal proceedings against them and that's why the third statement is wrong there will be legal proceedings against the violators right so this act has punitive measures as well it carries the punitive measures as well where it can punish the offenders so answer has to be two only uh, one and two are the correct one i mean this particular question i would say the first second uh, statements are correct but the third you be careful about this legal proceedings and all so you 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 should have risk it because uh, otherwise there is no point of any legislation if the legal proceedings cannot be taken care of right now next question 50 was with respect to the nipah virus now nipah virus was in news uh, very first time it was if you remember 2018 there was a massive outbreak of the nipah virus especially in kerala after 2019 18 even 2019 had nipah virus cases in kerala and very recently 2023 only in kerala we had the third time outbreak of the nipa virus that's why the question becomes really very very relevant now if you look at the nipa virus you you talk about the nipa virus as it says the nipa infection caused by nipa virus which kind of virus it is because i told you yesterday only viruses can be of two types it can be a dna virus it can be rna virus now in this case it is the rna virus and i told you yesterday the rna viruses they replicate very fast they spread very very fast and that makes them deadly as the covid was also rna virus a single stranded virus right and they replicate very fast and this nipah virus was rna virus closely related to the hendra virus category now nipah is zoonotic zoonotic disease means it is transmitted from the animals to the humans and that is one of the reasons why there was panic for the nipa virus uh, cases the host of this virus is most commonly the fruit bat which is called the flying fox also so bats are the natural carriers natural host of this particular virus the nipa virus and the transmission is done through the direct contact with infected animals close contact with infected person this this is very highly contagious and it's very uh, very fast it is going to spread among the person now be careful about the fatality rates any virus you talk about of course you have to take care of the fatality rate how fatal it is how much uh, are the death chances that we have so who with respect to nipah virus says the overall global case fatality of the nipah is somewhere around to 40 to 75 i mean if if uh, 40% is still a high percentage 75 is a high percentage means if uh, nipa is going to impact 100 uh, uh, you know people 40 to 75 are likely to die it's very high percentage very high fat, uh, for, uh, you know fatality rate but the third statement is wrong here it says that the nipa fatality rate is above 75 if it would have been above 75 above 75 percentage this could have been the one of the deadliest virus that we have encountered so fatality rate is wrong it is 40 to 75 because more than 75 is going to create lot of panic guys lot of panic the first and the second statements are correct answer has to be b so now you you could have think in this question that how can it have such a high fatality rate because this looks more unrealistic 
something having fertility of above 75 makes it very deadly and if that would have been the case probably uh, this could have spread uh, more panic into the people and probably you you would have seen nipah virus coverage even more right so clearly this looks more exaggerated kind of thing so i would have eliminated this straight forward uh, may, you may have you may have this doubt of dna rna viruses but think like most of the viruses most of the famous viruses that you have seen the zika virus the nipah virus the covid virus all of them most of them in fact are the rna viruses you have more common rna viruses than the dna viruses and of course it is zoonotic we know we have seen the pictures of the bat transmitting it animal from animals to the uh, to the human so yeah it was this question i would say very easy uh, something you can attempt easily by eliminating and by applying more of the common sense that you guys have right so that may that uh, takes us to the question number 51 and uh, look at this this uh, nipa outbreak and look at this virus this bat which is the natural carrier here in this particular case okay this is important guys now question 51 was with respect to the prevent prevention of the cruelty to the animal act 1960 though this act is quite you know quite um, i would say it's a very uh, it was very earlier that we have made this 1960 act but it is still relevant even it it was formulated say uh, 60 years back it is still very relevant and why it is relevant we need to understand we need to read about this particular act this prevention of the cruelty against the animals it was enacted 1960 to prevent the infliction or unnecessary pain or the suffering on the animals as the name says so we are trying to prevent the cruelty against the animals so name of the act itself says we are trying to control and minimize the unnecessary pain or suffering on the animals this particular act provide the establishment of the animal welfare board of india it was under this act only we set up the animal welfare board of india which is a statutory advisory body that is important so which body or which organization is constitutional statutory non statutory statutory now this thing becomes really important for upsc exam so whenever you read about any uh, of the body organization always be careful if it is constitutional non constitutional statutory non statutory becomes important now this particular act cruelty uh, prevention of cruelty against animals this act provides some guidelines guidelines for the exhibition of the performing animals which performing animals so you know that there are some animals like for example uh, in for example in circus you have lots of animal performances right i mean of course uh, this uh, particular act give permission like you know some of the animals can be used as a performing animals but there are guidelines for it you can use animals for the exhibition for perform performing animals in the circus or other animal uh, you know events but there are certain guidelines any person who is not registered under the act is not going to uh, use the animals not going to uh, you know do anything with the animals <coughs> or any animal which is being barred from that list or any any animal which is banned that this animal cannot be used as a performing then you can't use it so there are specific guidelines who which animal can be used as a performing animal under what conditions this particular act also gives us guideline for the experimentation on the animals if you are going to do some experiments for the scientific purpose let's say for the case, for the uh, for the purpose of some vaccine development you want to do some guidelines so you want to do some experimentations yeah you can do that if you are discovering a new physiological knowledge if you are trying to uh, cure any disease if you are going to do any research of, on a vaccine so in that case the experimentation on the animals is permitted under this particular act but at the same time this act also lays the process of killing if there if any animal is suffering if any animal is suffering from some uh, 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 a non curable disease how to kill that particular animal even those provisions uh, processes are given okay in this particular act so everything is fine with the with the four statements the only problem that i see here is with the statement number 
द स्टेटमेंट टू से एक्ट कंप्लीटली प्रोहिबिट्स एग्जीबिशन ऑफ परफॉर्मिंग एनिमल्स नो इट अलाउज बट विद सर्टन गाइडलाइंस सो यू कॉन्ट कंप्लीटली बैन द परफॉर्मिंग एनिमल्स दैट दैट इज नॉट दैट इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी इजी एंड दैट इज नॉट डिजायरेबल ऑल्सो so the first statement is correct yes uh, uh, the animal welfare board of india was established under this particular act yes it gives process of the killing provide guidelines for experimentation yes yes so answer has to be only 3 uh, i would say definitely this was this question was a hard question it was a tough one uh, you could have skip this question because there are four statements and every statement uh, is very factual but again if you apply your common sense if you try to risk it you can risk it because uh, this animal welfare board of india is very famous and we know under the act we have got the uh, this act ha uh, na and this completely prohibited looks very you know uh, extreme statement you could have eliminated that also uh, yeah third and fourth could have troubled you so you can skip it all but you can risk it if you are able to solve at least two or three of the statements question number 52 was with respect to Uh, there there were two statements and be very careful this question says which statement is not correct not correct first statement says the idea of one nation one election because it is very much in the news uh, our our prime minister modi has proposed this idea n number of times at different different occasions and we are we are we are seeing it in the last uh, say 8 to 10 years this idea actually gained a momentum one nation one election when i say one nation one election that means we are talking about simultaneously holding the elections across the country uh, with respect to the lok sabha elections and legislative assembly of the state assembly uh, states but is it very practical is it possible we'll talk about that also but yeah the idea of one nation one election actually means conducting the uh, elections of lok sabha and vidhan sabha together simultaneously so first statement is correct then the second statement has a problem it says the lok sabha and the state legislature went to the polls together in 1952 only now again your keyword is only no 1995% the words only all they are they are they have some suspicious element hidden now in this particular case no we have we have got more than one occasions we have actually done the simultaneous elections uh so you need to have a little bit knowledge here so one election one nation one election i told you uh it is talking about the two together now the problem with the second statement is so there was a practice of the simultaneous election in india and it was 1951 52 57 62 and 67 so at four occasions we have actually conducted the elections of lok sabha and uh, vidhan sabha together but again that schedule could not be maintained lot of uh, state governments they uh, you know they could not complete their terms so and then later on due to some other reasons some administrative issues this process could not be uh, carried forward this process could not be continued now very recently in 2018 now this debate actually gave birth to the law commission uh, report headed by justice uh, uh, you know b b s chauhan and even the law commission recommended the simultaneous elections could not be held with existing framework of the constitution first you need to amend the constitution get it ratified at least by 50% of the states that is called a special majority this is what you call as a special majority so but before but first you have to make lot of changes then only it is possible so clearly we have done it multiple times so if you look at the question the second statement and this is what this was a very easy question because first statement to says everything about it and the second is wrong uh, you are supposed to not correct the answer has to be b not correct because this suspicion we have done it multiple times right so yeah this this can be attempted very easily very simple question could have been attempted with a very common uh, sense and basic sense of the polity and if you have read about it then it was even easier the next question was with respect to the global hunger index so any time and every time you are you are reading or revising any indexes the very first thing to that you should pay attention to is who is releasing that particular index any report 
any index the very first thing you have to think or you have to learn revise is who is going to publish it release it who is going to uh, get it done so here in the case of global hunger index now in the question itself it is given it is published by the concern worldwide and wealth wealth uh, hunger life these both of them are ngos both of them are ngos uh, and you are supposed to figure out which statements are correct which are not but before i talk about the statements you should be aware of the global hunger index because it's a it, it is it is one of the most important index that is going to measure the hunger <coughs> state in in a very comprehensive manner so talking about the global hunger report it is annually published jointly annually published by these two ngos a uh, concern worldwide is ngo from ireland and wealth hunger life is an ngo from germany now recently it was conducted for 125 countries and india has not really done well because india's ranking was 111 out of 125 this is global hunger index you see so in india and india actually slipped down from its rank india was at 107 out of 121 countries way back in 2022 but this year 2023 we have actually slipped four locations and right now in india's case india is actually going through serious problem of hunger in fact this report tells us in india india has the highest child wasting rate of approximately 19% what is child wasting i'm sure you have you have read this uh, uh, word a lot of times when i say child wasting <coughs> it means according to uh, my age if i if i am or according to my height if i'm not going to have enough weight if i'm underweight as per my height that word is called as child wasting and india has the highest child wasting percentage of approximately 19% in fact india's hunger level is considered to be a serious hunger level you would be surprised to know that even pakistan bangladesh nepal and even sri lanka they have better rankings than india in this particular global hunger index right and this global hunger index actually has a score that the whole index is prepared using the four indicators and three dimensions the overall uh, this whole index has a score of 0 to 100 where 100 actually means maximum hunger and 0 is a good score as minimum as possible it it tells you the minimum hunger so the the higher the number the more is the hunger level you talking about this uh, particular index global hunger index it has three dimensions with four indicators the very first dimension it has is inadequate food supply the second dimension is the child mortality and the third dimension is child nutrition under nutrition within that it has four dimensions in inadequate food supply it talks about under nourishment child mortality case it talks about under 5 mortality rate how many children die before the 5 years of the age and it talks about the wasting and stunting wasting i told you stunting is when you don't have enough height as per your age as per your age whatever has to be your height if you are not able to achieve that that is that means you are stunted in india the stunting and wasting burdens are really really high so three dimensions with four indicators try to remember it uh, there were questions i think i think in 2016 or 17 there was a previous year question where it was asked about the global hunger index and the and the question was asking about which of them are one of the indicators of that i remember it was 16 or 17 okay so this this question becomes even relevant today and this is a very important question first statement is fine the rankings are and this is a very factual thing so it's it's a pure fact based question you can't do any guess work but at least you are aware that india has a poor ranking in the hunger index that much you can think but the second statement looks very uh, wrong it says the score is 0 to 100 higher score meaning less hunger no uh, the higher score means having the maximum hunger and zero is the minimum hunger so second statement is wrong Uh, the right answer has to be a this question again it was a it was a medium level kind of question but yes you could have easily attempted it 
you you can take a little of little bit of risk on the ranking maximum times it this rankings are correct maximum times i've seen the rankings are correct uh, maybe the trends the trend of the ranking is something you have to be careful about the rankings are mostly correct and please be careful about these scores like lot of uh, indexes are 0 to 1 lot of are 0 to 100 in certain cases 0 is bad 100 is good so you have to be little careful but in this case it talks about maximum number with maximum hunger okay now question number 54 this question 54 was with respect to the condition for recognition as a state party so in india we have national parties we have the state parties right now when when does any political party gets the tag of a state party that becomes important and right now we have seen lot of parties are uh, they 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 got themselves uh, into national party some party became state party some become uh, parties become the national parties so what are the conditions when when you and every if you are recognized as a national party of course you have certain privileges certain privileges you get as a state party also you get certain privileges right now what are the conditions when your party is going to be called as a state party there are particular some uh, hardcore rules which are laid down so the very first rule is based on the percentage of the votes if your party is able to secure eight percent of the total valid valid port, uh, valid votes polled in the state at any general election to the lok sabha from that particular state or state legislative assembly if you are able to get at least eight percent of the valid votes then you are eligible to to be qualified as a state party you become a state party recently aam admi party has become the state party like few years back the latest one to get recognized was the aam admi party second condition is with respect to the seats if you are able to win three percent seats or at least three seats in legislative assembly at any general election to the state legislative assembly or more or if you win at least one seat in Lok Sabha for every 25 seats at any general election, then also you are, a, you are eligible to, be, to become a state party. And then you have the third, the combination of the vote and the seats. If you go by the third method, if you are having 6% of the valid votes, not if not 8, if you are having 6% and you are able to win one seat in the Lok Sabha from that state or... 6% of the votes and you are able to win two seats in the state legislative assembly elections then also you become a state party the third is the mix so look at this the percentage is same 6% valid votes the only thing is in case of Lok Sabha election you should have won at least one seat for the state assembly election you should have won at least the two seats then you are you become a state party now if you look at the if you look at this particular question what does it say the first statement says a party should secure at least 6% of the valid votes. Yes, we uh, agree 6% valid votes. But what if it, it wins one seat in what? In one seat in the Lok Sabha, right? 6% plus one seat in Lok Sabha, not in the state. For the state assembly, it has to win two seats. Similarly, the second statement is also wrong because it says the 6% valid vote is fine. But it says it should win two seat in the Lok Sabha. No, two seat in the state assembly. Right? Yes or no? So 6% vote, one seat in Lok Sabha, two seat in a state assembly. Now this was a very direct question. And in your books in Lakshmi Kant or any book, any standard book that you read, there is, there is very clearly the rules are given when a party becomes a state party and a national party. Now this, I would say it was a medium one, but something you could have attempted because... It's a very standard kind of topic. It's a very basic topic that you are supposed to learn and remember. Okay, and see, this is a fact-based. If you are not confident about it, then please skip. Because this, this is something that you can't apply any logic. Okay, now only thing you can think of is, yeah, you can think that why do I need one seat for the state? At least uh, for the state, I have to have more seat than I can win in the Lok Sabha because Lok Sabha is more of a national election. So one vote should be sufficient. 
but that logic is not going to be applied because what about the six percentage votes because there are eight percent criteria also so you really cannot do much of the guesswork it's a fact based question so you should know it in a straightforward manner now the next question <coughs> the next question is with respect to the cbi now in case of the cbi it says the cbi is a statutory body no it is not please remember one thing always cbi is non constitutional and non statutory it is neither in the constitution it is not even by any act of parliament so it's a non statutory and non constitutional body one thing that many people take uh, do a mistake they think the cbi is under ministry of home affairs it is not CBI functions under the Department of Personal, which which is a part of Ministry of Personal, Pension, and Public Grievances. Home Ministry does not have any control on the CBI. It is non-constitutional, non-statutory. It is, but it is the nodal Indian agency. Whenever you have to coordinate the investigations uh, of the Interpol, which is International Police, then CBI is the nodal agency. But then, from where it derives its power, the CBI derives its power. from the act called as delhi special police established act 1946 the central government always authorized the cbi to investigate investigate a crime in a state but only only after the consent of that state the two types of the consent can be there a state can give cbi a general consent if it 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 got a general consent that every for every case the cbi need not to take the permission because if you are given a general consent you can go and investigate the cases n number of times but in certain cases you are not given a general consent then you are given a specific for every case you have to first go and uh, take the permission from the state government then only you can operate in that state but but in case you were given general consent and some states have recently it was in news that states like punjab bengal tamil nadu they have withdrawn the general consent from the cbi but if the if the case is already under investigation nothing changes for that case but any new case is not going to be registered you can't register in any new case in that particular state if you are not given a general consent but in case the supreme court and the high court has directed the cbi to investigate a crime in any particular state if the order is coming from the court then even without the consent of the state the crime could have been investigated now in this particular case the first statement is clearly wrong the first statement is incorrect and if i know that you 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 can simply you have got only one option that is option number d because every option says number 1 is correct no it is not correct number 1 is incorrect so only one option i have and that is the option number d so second technically becomes correct so this again it was an easy one something you could have attempted because cbi is very much in the news <coughs> and very straight forward question it was next question is with respect to the lok adalats now there are certain cases which are given in front of you how many of these cases can be referred to lok adalat first you should know about the lok adalat so lok adalat is something that you 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 must have heard of lok adalat is like a public uh, you know lok adalat is more of a public dispute forum it's a forum where disputes are settled and compromised amicably now you 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 know that if you are going to take every case to the court uh, there is al already a pendency in the court and you can't uh, keep piling the cases in the courts right so to address that pendency and to fast track the uh, uh, the justice system we have got the alternative dispute resolution the adr mechanisms one of that adr is like we have the fast track courts we have other things also one of that alternative dispute redressal mechanism is the lok adalat lok adalat is going to comprise of a judicial officer who is going to be the chair chairman it must have a lawyer as well and a social worker as a member and this is this is the constituents uh, the composition of a lok adalat remember lok adalat have a role of a statutory conciliators only and they do not have any judicial role now this statement itself become very very important lok adalat is only going to persuade the parties and they cannot pressurize them 
to come into the conclusion lok adalat is is it's just a it will provide you a forum where you have a chance to di- uh, compromise uh, the settlement you you can simply settle your disputes it's not going to pursuit but can only uh, tell you that okay this is how you can d- do it now which kind of cases are referred to the lok adalats now lok adalat cases can be of two types any case which is pending before the court so you can settle that pending court uh, case outside the court also as a lok adalat forum you can do that or if the dispute is not yet brought into the court it is still a pre litigation state so before filing the case only you have a chance to settle uh, do the settle out of the court right so these two type of the cases are mainly referred to the lok adalat which type of the cases are not referred or not included in the lok adalat if there is if this there is any not non compoundable case non compoundable ke offenses are non compoundable offenses are the serious crime that cannot be settled through compromise there has to be punishment like your murder like your rape like any such case and even the cases that relate to the divorce even those divorce cases are not going to be referred to lok adalat divorce cases are to be settled by the court and court only remember any award decision made by the lok adalat is going to have a decree of a civil court means the decision of the lok adalat is going to be final and it is going to be binding on all the parties if you are not satisfied with that there is no provision for the appeal against the award if you are not satisfied then you have to uh, go and apply for a fresh case you have to start initiate the legislation once again but that particular award which is being given by lok adalat is binding and final cannot be uh, challenged in the court of the law so that is why certain cases are allowed under lok adalat certain are not so now you can you can straight away eliminate divorce cases are not going to be a part of that now cases which are non compoundable again are not going to be lok adalat cases 1 and 3 are uh, right the answer has to be b now this question i would say yes it was a tough one a uh, lot of us do not know about these kind of cases it was a tough one if you have no idea you can skip because it was a tough question uh mm, yeah so it was a it was a hard one but now i hope after the discussion you are going to remember about these cases the next question 57 was again with respect to the national legal service authority of india better known as nalsa now you have to figure out which statement is correct with respect to nalsa what is a nalsa you know the full form right so nalsa is basically a statutory body this is important which body is statutory or not is important for you to remember it is a statutory body established way back 1995 it was established under the legal service authority act 1987 that is why it's a statutory authority why nalsa was established to basically speedy disposal of the cases for the purpose of speedy disposal of the cases and also to reduce the burden on judiciary the national uh, uh, this nalsa legal services were started the chief justice of india is always going to be the patron in chief of the nalsa now this is something very important who is going to be the head of that the patron in chief is always going to be the chief justice of india while the second senior most judge of the supreme court is going to be its executive chairman and always remember the purpose of nalsa is to provide free legal services to the weaker sections of society it was established as a nationwide forum for providing free and competent legal services to the weaker sections for that purpose it was established and that makes it really important guys now rem- now also remember one thing to organize the lok adalat for the settlement of the dispute okay this this was a uh, one of one of uh, another object of this uh, uh, nalsa services it was under nalsa only we we got the provision of organizing the lok adalats lok adalat uh, the nalsa also aims to organize legal awareness campaign especially in the rural areas so last question was with respect to uh, lok adalat now you know lok adalat are actually settled under nalsa right and and ultimately who are the eligible groups 
who are going to get the these free legal services under the nalsa like women children member of scst industrial worker any victim of any mass disaster violence any kind of disaster or hazard they are eligible to get the free legal advices disabled person person in custody even the victims of trafficking in human beings or beggars all of them are eligible to get the free legal services by nalsa that makes them so so important guys okay now if you look at the question now the first statement absolutely wrong is it constitutional it is not it is simply a statutory body so that's why it is important for you to remember which body is constitutional which is not which is statutory which is not is union law minister the pattern in chief no it is always going to be the chief justice of india as the pattern in chief of the nalsa services the third statement is correct it is about free legal services to the weaker section and which who all comes as a weaker section i have already discussed the entire list of the eligible beneficiaries it also organizes the lok adalat yes so answer has to be two only now this question i would say yes it was again a tough question there is no doubt in that it was a tough question but um i think i think the first statement is very obvious because in the entire constitution we have not yet uh, read about the nalsa so clearly it is not constitutional and we know that lok adalats are organized and this you could have guessed because how law minister is going to be pattern in chief because when you talking about the legal services authority probably it, it has to it has to be logically it should be the cgi of india the chief justice of india and the purpose is very obvious why why would you start a legal services to help the weaker sections of society so you you could have risked this question it was a it was a tough one but uh, something you could have solved okay now the question number 58 is about the review petition now in the review petition you are given some uh, some of the articles now very straight forward i can say article 123 has absolutely nothing to do with review petition because this is a very famous article article 123 we have read n number of times it talks about the ordinance making power isn't it ordinance making power of the president of india and 213 talks about the ordinance making power of the governor so article 123 has nothing to do with the review petition of the supreme court i can straight away eliminate that okay now first we'll talk about it then we'll come back so as i have just mentioned the 123 is the ordinance making power when it comes to the supreme court the power to review its own judgment own decisions that is actually article 137 now there are certain articles which are very uh, very much used in the last uh, say 10 or 12 months so do take care of those uh, like like for example article 142 even article 142 was very much in the news do read about 142 which talks about uh, delivering the complete justice by the supreme court it, it was invoked many times and supreme court has invoked 137 also for reviewing reviewing its own judgments and this power is subject to the rules made by supreme court under article 145 that you know that uh, supreme court should have a power to review its judgments so first statement is wrong and second very logical thing so as per the supreme court rules if you have to file any review petition it's not like you can file it any time you want there is a certain window every every review petition should be filed within 30 days from the judgment okay of which review is sought it should not be like any there is there is no uh, indefinite timeline if you have any issue with the judgment then file your complaint with, within 30 days and that also before the same bench that had delivered the decision you are not going to introduce any new judge also the same bench that has given the verdict is going to review your petition that is the provision guys so both statements in this statement in this question are wrong it says review petition can be filed any time logic the apply your logic is it possible no supreme court is not going to because if that that would be the case you will have more pendency more pendency is going to be there there has to be a time frame even if you don't remember what is the time frame apply lo logic here there has to be time frame of reviewing the judgment cannot be any time indefinite time period right so here the answer has to be a uh, correct one it, it says neither it was an easy question because 123 is very famous and second can be logically solved i think everyone everybody should have attempted that question 
then we have the question number 59 question 59 what does question 59 says with reference to hindi language consider the following now hindi language of course this this is very much in news these days so you should know little basics what constitution says about the hindi language well the constituent assembly of india adopted hindi as the official language many people have this mistake in their head hindi is not national language in fact there is no national language of india there is no national language india cannot have a national language we have this much we have uh, so much of diversity because of the that plural nature of our diverse diverse languages we are not going to have any national language we have hindi as the official language <coughs> okay now when it, when it, when you talk about the official language policy of the union it says hindi can be used as official language of the central government uh, even at the international form of indian numerals it hindi can be used other than hindi english is can can also be used for the official purposes in fact in parliament every business has to be in english or hindi language or in case of any special case the the uh, speaker or the chairperson can allow a member to speak and address the house in the mother tongue but that is only under some special circumstances otherwise the whole business of parliament is done in english or hindi because both are the official languages again it says uh, uh, as per the constitution there are many provisions in the constitution that says government of india can progressively use hindi and also can promote the use of hindi if you read uh, uh, the article 350 351 350 a b c all these articles they have some provisions with respect to the uh, uh, persuasion incentive and and in goodwill hindi can be prom prom uh, promoted by the central government there are provisions and for that matter only this present government is uh, is actually spreading the use of hindi to every nook and corner of the country right the first statement definitely is wrong you could have eliminated it straight forward because hindi is not national language there is no national language of india so one is wrong i could have eliminated it straight away and that gave me the right answer so in this question now these kind of question you have a luxury of eliminating it simply use your logic can india has a national language india cannot have it. like we do not have a national religion we can't have a national language also right second and third are correct in this case it was an easy one because elimination made made it really easy for us something you everyone could should have attempted right okay now last question question number 60 was with respect to the secretary general of the parliament now what secretary general of the parliament is and how it functions something very important that you should know now in parliament secretariat you know what is a parliament secretariat it's an independent body that functions under the guidance and control of the presiding officer presiding officer can be speaker uh, in case of lok sabha can be uh, can be chairperson in case of the rajya sabha right that's how both are called presiding officer a parliament secretariat is very important because this parliament secretariat body that consist of these four very important uh, constituents parliament secretariat consist of uh, secretary general consist of additional secretaries joint secretaries and we have other officers and staff because parliamentary secretariat advises the presiding officers so every presiding officer has a support system and that support system comes in the form of parliament secretariat the function is to guide and provide the speaker and the chairperson with any information that they require for carrying out their work so now logically think if parliamentary secretariat is like a lifeline supporting system of the presiding officer so of course there are two secretary journals one for the lok sabha and one for the rajya sabha Uh, uh, both are going to have a separate uh, secretary journals now please remember every secretary journal is going to be appointed by the presiding officer themselves because ultimately they are going to they are going to get the support of their uh, parliament uh, uh, staff so they are going to appoint those secretary journal themselves the position of secretary journal is equivalent to cabinet secretary cabinet secretary 
is the post that uh, highest post any IS officer can get in the government of India. So the, the position is equivalent to the cabinet secretary of, of those uh, secretary general, right? And the aid advise the presiding officers in discharging their constitutional and statutory responsibility. Now, if you look at the question, I know it was a tough question. It, it, is, it is something which is not easy for everyone. Now, it says the two secretary general, one for Lok Sabha, one for Rajya Sabha. I mean, this much I can think. How can one person do the two jobs? It, it is not possible. So, first is correct. But the second statement was incorrect. Who is going to appoint the secretary general of the parliament? Not the president, the presiding officer himself. Okay. And the position is not equivalent to cabinet minister. Cabinet minister is a different post. He is going to get the post of cabinet secretary, the highest that any IS officer can get. Right? So second and third are wrong. The fourth is correct. For first and fourth are very obvious they are very simple statement but yes of course second and third makes this statement this question as a tough question so if you are not comfortable if you have no idea at all because you know because obviously there are so many appointments done by the president so could have been very tough for the guessing work and even the uh, and but 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 you apply one logic but at least this much this much logic you could have applied that do you think secretary general of the parliament is going to have the equivalent post of the cabinet minister? No. Only the leader of the opposition gets the uh, perks and privileges equal, equivalent to the cabinet minister, not the secretary general. Because in the hierarchy, secretary general is not going to be promoted at that particular level, right? So only two are correct. It was a tough one. You, you could have risked it. Uh, but of course, some statements are going to trouble you. So little you have to be bit more careful for this statement so that is all from my side guys that's all uh, in the part number three i hope you have enjoyed you have learned a lot of new things so uh, see you guys in the part number four uh, but before that if you are still not sure of which test series you are going to subscribe i recommend you to subscribe the pmf is test series because we have given the quality questions as you can see in all our videos and plus very importantly now the PMF IS test series is available at a very special discounted price of 499 rupees only. It is for only for a limited time period. Do check out the link of the test series must be given somewhere in the description. Check it out. So this is Ashish Malik signing off and best wishes for UPSC 2024. For any guidance, any queries, you are most welcome. You can drop your query in, in the comment section box. I will reply to your queries myself. If you have any doubt, if you want any personal guidance, if you want any mentorship, PMF, IS and me, we both are available for you. You can reach out to us anytime you want. Take care. God bless you. Jai.